Is it on now? <gasps> it's on now. Oh, are we winning? No, sorry. I'm out. Okay, so faith is believing. It's not just believing. It's living in such a way that demonstrates that you believe that God is who he says he is and that he will do what he says he will do. It's not enough to just say it. You've got to live that way. So that's what faith is. And we discover a couple things. Um, first of all, I love this quote by C.S. Lewis. This is a great quote. It says this, if you don't study theology, that won't mean that you have no ideas about God. It will mean that you have a lot of wrong ideas about God. It makes it so critical that we be anchored in a biblical perspective. It makes it so critical that we have a good theological philosophy. We have got to be on our game on this issue. So um, I would like to tell you that there are times in my life that I feel a little like this character. Anybody tell me what the name of this character is? Pigman. Pigman, I'm so glad. I was really worried that we had a generation that knew not Charles Schultz. And that would have made me really, really sad. Okay, this comes from the Peanut cartoon. And in the Peanuts cartoon, Pigpen walked around, and he had this cloud of dirt and dust that kind of went with him everywhere he went. And I do not feel like Pigpen because I'm dirty. It's a different thing. I feel like as I walk around, my life is like always kind of surrounded by a little bit of emotional chaos. Like there's, there's always some stuff there that's a challenge, that's an obstacle, that I don't know if I can handle, that I'm overwhelmed by. And so this emotional chaos that I have to contend with in my life, I've had to figure out how to manage that. I've had to figure out how do I contend with this? How do I survive this? How do I keep going with what I need to keep doing while I'm fighting these clouds of emotional chaos? What's my answer? And so in the last few years, I've really developed um, a box that for me illustrates so importantly the truths that contain my chaos. The truths that allow me to go through difficult times and do so successfully. To keep going. And these are theological truths. And the important thing about these theological truths is these are truths about God. Listen, there's a lot of emphases in Christianity in best-selling books that are all about everything you need to know about you. I got to tell you, Everything you need to know, you know, need to know about God. And if you know that, it will tell you what you need to know about you. So it is so critical that we become students of our God, that we look to understand him and the truth of who he is, because it really does affect how we face every day. So our first part of my box, theological box that contains my chaos, is this. <laughs> Sorry about that. This is, see, if I wouldn't have turned it on. Okay. This is the bottom of my box. This is this truth that anchors my box. And that is that God is immense and infinite, which makes him very different than I. Now, there are times that I feel immense, but that's usually after a big meal. And as, uh, as, as much as sometimes I don't feel like it, there is, an, uh, there is a limit to my size, right? I'm only so big. But our God is both immense and infinite. He is so different than us. We cannot contain him. And that's why the very beginning of this illustration proves the weakness of this illustration. That for this illustration to be really true, the bottom of this box would have to extend into eternity. It would have to be magnified in regards to size for us to really understand the fullness of God. But that this truth right here, this il uh, illustrated in scripture in Job, proves to us that there's a big old difference between us and God. And sometimes what we want to do is we want to decide that God is just like a bigger version of us, or maybe a little better version of us. That's not true. There's like no comparison point. And this is well illustrated in the story of Job, because if you remember what was going on in Job, he lost everything. His life was shattered. And he sits there trying to figure out how he goes on. And his friends come and they give him terrible advice. And his wife comes, not helpful. And we get to the end of Job and he turns to ask some questions to God. And then God says, okay, my turn. I have some questions. 
I love this passage. Between chapters 39 and 42, there is just some hysterical stuff. And if you do not think God is a God of a little bit of sarcasm, don't read that section or the, the section about, never mind, about circumcision in, in Galatians 5 because that's got a lot of sarcasm too. Okay, turns out our God is funny and sarcastic in some of the passages of Scripture. And in here, he says, let me explain the difference between you and me. Because there's a big difference. And Job, I need you to understand the fullness of the difference between you and me. And here it is. Here's some illustrations. Uh, where were you when I laid the earth's foundation? Sorry, were you there? I don't remember needing to consult you when I did that. Tell me if you understand who measured out its dimensions. Could you measure out the dimensions of all of creation? No, Job. No, you can't. Surely you know who stretched a measuring line across it. On what were its footings set? Who laid its cornerstone while the morning stars sang together and all the angels shattered for joy? Listen, Job, you don't even know what you're talking about. But I was there. So if you want to know how life works, you got to trust the source. You know, there's some other funny things in there. Um, one of my favorite things is when God explains to Job, do you realize that you can't contend with me? You can't even contend with my creation. Are you going to take some of the creations I made that are really, really scary and give them to your daughters as pets? Are they going to put them on a leash? No. Here's the thing. God is so much bigger than what we are. And if we don't understand that up front, then we're missing important parts of the theology that can anchor us in really, really difficult times, that can contain that cloud of craziness. So here's the second one. Not only... Is he immense and infinite? But he's also good and loving. And that's important because I think sometimes we think about the people that have power in our lives and recognize that just because they have power doesn't mean they have good intent. Any, anybody teach American politics? No? Okay. Um, if you ever take that class, uh, American government, you will learn that power does not mean good intent. The fact that we have this almighty God who is good and loving is amazing. And it's so important because when we get to Romans chapter 8, and I'm going to encourage you guys, you need to study Romans 8 until you know it inside and out. This passage for me has been such a critical one that I go back to over and over and over and over again because here's how it starts. Do you know what? Sometimes our world stinks. Creation groans. We groan. You know why we groan? Because we go, this isn't okay. What part of this seems okay? You know it's okay to recognize that sometimes things aren't okay. Sometimes things are awful. And Romans 8 acknowledges that. Sometimes things are terrible and creation groans. But the good news is that's not the end of the chapter. What we find out is that we are not alone in our groaning. I love the fact that within that chapter, it illustrates that all three members of the Godhead, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, have a role in groaning with us. They get it. They understand. I want to remind you, this was not God's plan. God had a plan that was perfect, but he gave us free will. Because he gave us a choice, we said, we choose the hard way. And now he has spent all of time redeeming our terrible decisions because of his great grace, because of his love for us. So we find out that, yes, creation groans, but the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, they are with us in our groanings. And then he explains that what he then does is take the awfulness, the difficulties of our life, and he uses them to bring about good. Now, our definition of good is usually different than his definition of good. Um, I don't know. I could think of a lot of things that would be good. Uh, this funny thing happened uh, about a month ago on our campus. Um, one of our students won the lottery, a, a million dollars. There's now, in one of our dormitories, one of those supersized checks because this crazy dude went down to Sheets and put down 20 bucks 
and won a million dollars. Now, let me just encourage you, I do not recommend gambling. And if you look at the statistics behind there, uh, you don't win. You don't usually win. But this crazy college kid now has a supersized check for a million dollars and a really big tax bill. Okay, there's part of the me that goes, God, <laughs> let me just tell you the things I could do with a million dollars. <laughs> like, really? And they would all be in your service. I mean, just trust me, I would do great things, I'm sure, completely selfless things entirely, except maybe a couple minor things, but that would just be, you know. Um, I want a Dodge Charger. But it would really just be, here's why I would want a Dodge Charger. It would really just be because, you know, Lord, you send me out to speak and connect with audiences, and I am sure that if I have a Dodge Charger, it will really help me connect. I'm sure, I'm sure of it. I'm sure it will advance your, so that probably would come out of the million dollars. But other than that, I would use it all for a good thing. Lord, I can figure out some things that would be good. A million dollars would be good. And yet, so many of the things that he sends my way are not million dollars. Million problems. Sometimes I feel that way because I'm a dorm parent. I have 34 daughters. One of them is related to me. The other ones are not. But I love them just the same. Well, mostly the same. Let me tell you, my idea of good is sometimes different than his idea of good. But he explains in this chapter what his idea of good is. And that is that he makes us more like Jesus. That what he is doing is he is conforming us to the image of his son. That's what's happening. And in this process, he's going through the chapter. We find out that he then makes us more than conquerors. A better translation is of that is actually super conquerors. He makes us extra big conquerors, not size-wise. And then he explains, none of this, not one bit of creation's groaning, not one bit of the things that we face can separate us from the love of God. Every single trial is bathed in the love of God. We are soaked in that no matter what's going on. And this is really important for me to know because I know my God is big and immense, but it sure does matter that I can trust him because he's also loving and good. That makes a big difference. So what else? Well, this is important. He is wise, and that also means wiser than me. And this is probably a big obstacle to me because I think I'm pretty smart. In fact, there's been times that people have had to remind me that there is no job opening in the Trinity. Because, honestly, there's times I would like to like explain to God what would be a better thing than what's actually happening now? Like, have you ever been in that position where you've thought, no, 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 this is not good. Like, this is, this is bad. See, the important thing about knowing that God is good is knowing that his definition of good is better than my definition of good. That I can trust his wisdom way beyond my own. That my ideas that I think are smart aren't really smart. Now, I told you earlier that we have a perfect illustration of this, not you, but somebody you know, because your ideas of what was good in junior high were probably not what was good, right? He has a perspective that we cannot even come close to. God sees not only the past, he sees the future, he sees how things weave together when we see fractions of what he can see. And that means that in the times that I go, okay, you said you're good, but I don't see how this is good, I have to default to the fact that he's smarter than I am. That if there's a problem then, if we go, okay, here's what God says is good, and here's what I say is good, his good has to win. Now, this is a critical problem today, and here's why it's a critical problem today. There are a whole bunch of people who want to claim the name of Christ and also decide which parts of the Bible that they have to follow. He's smarter than us. He was smarter than us when holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. He was smarter than us then. He is smarter than us now. And we have got to trust his plan for our world more than ours. Certainly more than our cultures because that's a big hot mess. Um, on top of this, so we've got God is immense and infinite. He is good and loving. He is wise. This one amazes me. He's involved and purposeful. Because I got to tell you, there's some really interesting um, things you can learn about God from music. Um, now, some of you are not old enough to know all of these. 
Um, but uh, for instance, when I was growing up, I learned some stuff. Um, one of the things I learned was from a song called What If God Was One of Us? I don't know if you've ever heard this one. Uh, just a slob like some of us, just a stranger on the bus trying to make his way back home. Um, trust me, God is not like one of us. Um, but then there was also this other song. It was a Bette Midler song. God is watching us. God is watching us. God is watching us from a distance. If you ever watch the music video, you will not have any idea what on earth that song is about. Um, it was actually written in the middle of um, or, uh, early part of a Middle Eastern war. And in the middle of it, she really appealed to the idea that the chaos of this world takes place because God is disengaged. And that could not be further than the truth. Scripture teaches us some stuff. It teaches us that God has been working in us. We are his masterpieces created to do good works that he has planned in advance for us to do. See, in high school, when I was like, I'm broken, here's what I didn't understand. He made me on purpose because he knew what was coming. And he knew that I needed to be different than my sister because he knew what was coming. That means he has orchestrated every part of my life, my personality, my experiences. He has put together a package because he's like, Linnell, I got a job. You have to be ready for that job. Here we go. That's a critical, critical truth. He is involved and purposeful in what he has been allowing in my life. He knows we've got a verse in Psalms that tells, tells us this, that he gathers our tears in a bottle. God is not watching us from a distance. He is holding us in our hurts. He is very aware of what's going on. He is orchestrating the things in our life that we need, that we desperately need. And that helps contain my chaos. This one's amazing, too. God is powerful. And I have to tell you, there are people who want to, want to believe in a God that's not powerful. They couldn't control things. They couldn't handle the difficulty in our world that maybe can do little prayer requests, but it would be foolish for us to ask the big ones. I got to tell you, ask the big ones. Imagine big things from your God, because this is what we're told in Ephesians. This is amazing. He is able to do immeasurably more than we can ask or imagine. I got to tell you, I can dream big. And he can do so much past that. He's not limited to easy prayer requests. And I, I find myself sometimes praying, God, this is the big one. To me. It's not a big one to him. This is something that he can do because he is that kind of powerful God. And he's faithful. For me, this is the top of my box. This is what like closes the lid and holds all of that emotional chaos inside. That God is faithful. And this is a theme that is repeated through scripture in so many different ways. I could have chosen a ton of different passages on this one. But Hebrews 6 is one of my favorite because I love this little phrase right in the middle of it where it says that we have this hope, the hope in the faithfulness of God, the hope in that he is the most stable thing in our universe. We have this hope as an anchor for our souls. And I love the imagery of that. People get a little confused about anchor imagery. Um, like all of the tattoos that have an anchor that say, I'll never sink. No, really, that's what anchors are supposed to do. That's a weird one for me. Um, <clears throat> I need an anchor. My life gets chaotic. I feel like I'm getting tossed about. But the faithfulness of God is what anchors me. And I want to kind of, I want to tell you some stuff. What is going to happen is in your life is that there are going to be moments that your God is going to meet you in a powerful way and you are going to know it could only have been him. And in those moments, as you sit so clearly in front of your God, your faith grows. And the next time that you're freaking out, you remember that moment. And then you get to see other moments and you collect these moments into stories. You collect these moments into memories.
they, then your faith becomes more and more and more and more and more stable. Now, y'all are young, and you might not have had a ton of these moments. I am blessed to be a pastor's kid, and there are a lot of days that I would not have put blessed and pastor's kid in the same sentence. Anybody else pastor's kids? There's some things that are uniquely terrible about being a pastor's kid, one of which is um, always being an illustration. Like just about everything I did ended up being an illustration in church. Maybe that's why I threw the frying pan. I don't know. Uh, but that also became an illustration. There's some things that are hard about being a pastor's kid. But one of the graces of my life as a pastor's kid was that there was never a time as I was growing up that um, the church actually paid the entirety of the paycheck that we needed. You know, back in those days in the 80s, um, it was pretty common for small churches to sometimes even intentionally not pay their pastors well um, because that way they would, you know, stay dependent on God. But in my dad's churches, I don't think it was an intentional thing. I was just think when you're in a small church, sometimes you don't have a lot of money. They didn't have a lot of money. They didn't pay my dad a lot of money. He had four daughters. The beautiful thing about that is I had the opportunity to see God meet my family at our heart's needs over and over and over and over again. If I were to just try to tell you the story about how God provided shoes for me and my sisters, it would take the next 45 minutes. Because over and over and over again, when we had a need and the money wasn't in the bank account, God said, I've got this. And let me show you how I've got this. I'll tell you, the two that are most amazing to me. My sister is a little bit more concerned about fashion than I was when I was growing up. Um, and I remember her going to my mom. We always had either a pair of brown shoes or black shoes. And they got these leather, boxy, not fashionable shoes because we would wear them to school and to play. We only had one pair of shoes. And you couldn't wear the tennis shoes to school because back then, Christian school t students loved Jesus and would never wear tennis shoes in school because that meant they loved, I don't know, don't ask me to explain that. Um, so we couldn't wear tennis shoes at school, so we had to have these like leather boxy shoes. They'd either be brown or black, so they matched the most outfits. And my sister went to my mom when she was like in fourth grade and said, Mom, I really wish I could have a blue pair of shoes. And mom said, Honey, I get that. Here's what we'll do. We'll keep watching at garage sales and we will stop and pray. So my sister and my mom started praying. My mom would come in to tuck us into bed that Janelle could have some blue shoes. And it was only a few weeks later that this woman walked up to my mom with a bag in a church and said, um, so my daughter got her daughter some shoes and they didn't fit her and I thought you have a bunch of girls and I bet you these will fit one of your girls. And mom just knew before she opened the bag that they were gonna be blue, blue shoes. And they were, and my twin sisters. The other one happened when I was um, a senior in high school. And uh, the team that I was playing on, the volleyball team, um, they got matching Mizuna volleyball shoes. Now, Mizuna was a top-of-the-line volleyball brand, and that meant those shoes came with the top-of-the-line volleyball price, which in 1990 was $85 for a pair of Mizuna tennis shoes, and which probably converts to, I don't know, like $400 today. It was a lot of money for these volleyball shoes. And I didn't even bother to tell my mom that the team was getting those shoes because there was no way on God's green earth that our family could afford $85 for a pair of volleyball shoes. Like, that was, that was what we do for the heat payments, you know, not for volleyball shoes. And I remember going to a game against Bridgeport Baptist Academy, and I was supposed to start that night, and uh, my coach came over, and he said to me, uh, she said to me, Linnell, you cannot play in the shoes that you are wearing. And the front of my shoes were peeling off. The soles were peeling off the front of my shoes. And true, I was struggling a little bit with tripping. But I'm like, no, 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 you are not going to bench me. Like, I cannot be benched. This is not okay that I get benched because of my stupid shoes. And I was like, coach, let me go see what shoes my mom's wearing. And I'm like, coach, just let me play tonight. And I promise by the next game, I'll have something else to wear. Like, coach, you got to let me play tonight. And my coach turns to me and she says, Linnell, there's a pair of shoes in the back of my van. Go see if those will work. And I go to the back of my coach's van, and the only thing, that she's like, had like four daughters too, so I'm like, lots of different sizes of shoes, we'll see what happens. So I open up the back of her van, and the only thing in the back of her van was a brand new Mizuno box of shoes in my size. And I got to wear that night's brand new $85 
It was in a volleyball shoot. That was amazing. I had so much fun. And at the end, I sprayed my little spray deodorant in the shoes, and I buffed him up a little bit, and I put him back in the box, and I put him back in my coach's van, and I threw my arms around her and said, thank you so much for letting me wear those shoes. I promise, I promise, coach, we'll find something else. I went to the next practice. My coach came up to me, and she said, Linnell, you're still wearing those shoes. And I said, I know I said I'd get it by the next game, but you got to give us a little time to find some other shoes. And she said, Linnell, there's a pair of shoes in the back of my van, and I want you to have them. I played my senior year in high school and my freshman year in college and my sophomore year in college. I played volleyball in shoes I had no business owning. And it's because my God not only met my needs, because he could have met my needs at Payless, but he took care of my wants. And I got to tell you, when you start accumulating stories like that and people go, nah, God's a myth, you go, oh, tell me some more about that. Because do I have some stories to tell you? Because my God has been faithful. Now, while you are accumulating those stories, until you have the ones of your own, here's what you get to do. You get to borrow the stories of others. You can start in the Bible. And you can find out in the Bible there is a God who is immense and he is loving and he is wise, way wiser than us. And he is good. And he is powerful. And he's involved. And he's faithful. And when you run out of the stories in the Bible, find people who have gray hair. Or color their gray hair. Because they have stories. They have stories to tell. They have seen the faithfulness of God. They have gotten to know a God that is worthy of our trust. And when we get all of the walls of this theological box, and they're firm, and they're steady, and we're grounded in those beliefs, guys, the chaos can't leak out. And when in my life I start finding out that I'm getting overwhelmed, and I'm getting upset, and the chaos is leaking out, I can start to think through which of these walls have I forgotten? Which of them? Is it because I all of a sudden thought I was smarter than God? Is it because I forgot that he knows? Is it because I forgot that he's good? Is it because I forgot that he's faithful? When I remember those things, everything's going to be all right. Let me pray. Father, I'm so grateful that this is the God I can pray to. And I'm so grateful that you are the God who has shepherded my life. And I pray that you would allow these kids to see you in your fullness. Let them see you in your power. Let them see you in your glory. But let them know that you are a good God who will meet them where they're at and who will always, always be faithful. And I pray that in Jesus' name. Amen.